Spoilers for Red Sonia She Devil with the Sword, Omnibus Number One. This comic starts off well enough. Yeah, it may be setting it up as something that turns bad later on, but is the truth? This comic run could just as easily be the beginning of a story arc halfway into any writer's stint on Red Sonia, as much as it could be its own beginning. That's a plus. Red Sonia is one of those characters you can always jump into. If you see a new writer has just joined the series, you've just found a new starting point. Michael Avon Oming and Mike Carey of Lucifer fame quickly develop Red Sony as someone who's been around the block. They do this while also making it simple and easy to understand exactly who she is. They take a long time before they jump into her origin, and they really flesh her out with rich narration and dialogue. This series, I believe, is during Mike Carey's time on Lucifer, which is legendary and sublime in its own right. He brings his ability to subtly separate the main character from everyone else with dialogue and narration alone. I don't know how much was Carrie or Oming, but I imagine that Carrie at least helps set the story's tone based on how familiar the writing is to me. This Red Sonia is the driest she's ever been, at least compared to the other writers I've read, this being Amy Chu, Roy Thomas, and Gail Simone. She's cold in conversations and bruised more than any other Red Sonia. It may have been a natural progression following a previous run, but it's hard to ignore when comparing her to Amy Chu's superhero or Gail Simone's spirited barbarian. From the beginning, she can see a threat from a mile away. She's immediately threatening, more than her pretty design and more than pure anger. The story's tone was set perfectly when she first entered the city of Gathia. She was surrounded by arrows aimed at her from every direction as a whole city hoped to capture her. This Redstonia blew through nearly every fighter in the city until she came up against a magical beast who failed to do anything more than tire her. My complaint with Chu's run was that it wasn't bloody or violent, making the action feel too friendly. I mean, if you have a sword, you should use a sword as it's supposed to be used. There's nothing friendly about the violence here, nor is Red Sonia. She's a badass, a cold-hearted killer, and she brings the gore I want to see in Sword and Sorcery comics, so that's a plus. When it comes to the art, I must preface this with the fact that this is a comic from 2010. The art is of an older time, but also not. It's from this weird place when comics still looked completely hand-drawn, but captures so much detail without looking like a cartoon. Everything feels like it was personally crafted with a stencil, but the coloring and inking is a bit stale and goes overboard in some parts. Some pages can look like bad CGI at times, if that comparison makes sense. The worst example of this is a two-page spread dedicated to a sex scene. The drawing, the detail, and the shape is fine, I guess, but the coloring is just off and makes everything shiny? And not for any good reason that makes sense? Red Sonia herself, though, is pretty well captured, I would say. She has a softer look to her than either Choose or Simone's run. But once again, she's more supermodel than Barbarian, which is just weird to me personally. It's not bad, I guess. It's what people expect of the character. I personally find that a bit weird contextually, and I don't particularly like it. At the same time, they're more qualified than me to comment on it. When it comes to the first arc, I had fun overthinking the subtle way the mythos of the She-Devil with the sword is built throughout the omnibus. It's an interesting point, brought up by an admirer but respectful friend of Red Sonia about the songs sung about her. Her immediate reaction was to scoff and say that they weren't entirely true. And this may seem a bit weird because this came after she blew through an army of guards, but it felt telling of how Red Sonia saw herself. The story is told of a slayer of beasts and monsters, man and not, but there's more behind her and why she is the way she is. On the most basic level, the creative team was trying to get across that Red Sonia doesn't adhere to anyone but without saying it. Others may not see that, because subtlety can be here and there with people. It may seem ridiculous considering her feats, but I appreciated the avenue they tried to take her down. At first. I'll save my more serious criticisms for later, because I can tell when Carrie leaves and this book becomes solely the product of Oming. I still have more to say about the first arc, where his hand can still be felt. The first villain doesn't seem like much at first, but the idea that he wanted to forcefully keep peace because of things he's done is thought-provoking. Once you learn that he's one of the ethnic minorities, one of the lower class races, because you know, it was written by a white dude, who's enslaved by the upper class, it colors his actions as this sort of guilt born from oppression. He becomes sympathetic in a way I had not expected. He seemed to believe in his own inferiority despite being physically and mentally capable of taking over a city. He learned to hate himself, his own race, and ultimately led to his worst nightmare coming to pass. The Slaughter of Gathia. It's fascinating because it was built up and executed using very little page space. There's a greater overarching threat being built up more than him, but he still ends up feeling like a well thought out character. 
and all it ultimately makes Redstone's defeat of him feel far less rewarding for her, if at all. When he's dead among his fallen people, many innocent and some not, Red Sony has seemed far more like a tragic hero than an Avenger. This arc ends with this chilling inner monologue from her. My name, however, Red Sonia. I thought it was for my fire hair, but now I know. It means blood, death to my enemies and my friends. I leave a red wake behind me, red for death, red for anger, red for blood. It ends on a narratively high note, but a low one for the character. What then followed was an ongoing story where Red Sonia hunted down the religious institution that allowed for the first Ark's villain to come to power. It began with a few one-off chapters where she found herself with a companion who each had a complete and well-written arc. The first one about Ander searching- <sighs> The first one about Ander searching for his father's treasure may be stereotypical, but the dialogue and narration carries through past being generic, I promise, especially in its climax. Here's when Carrie officially leaves the book, and the plot becomes more by the book. As long as the writing matched Carrie's style, the generic plot just were still compelling despite everyone being able to see it coming a mile away. But then they did this thing, where they finally got to her origin and it got weird. First, the art got weird. As a kid, Sonya looked like some kind of gremlin who always had this weird smile on her face. It was incredibly distracting, and the origin overall wasn't that much better. Actually, I wouldn't even say it was good at all. It's different from Simone's. This is the older, more... Not necessarily classic, but common origin. I would not give it the compliment of calling it a classic. This time, unlike other times I've heard about, the sexual assault was seemingly done... tastefully? I guess, for lack of a better word? I wish there was a better word I could think of, but I am... Uh, I guess, kind of illiterate? Or that's also not the right word. As you can see, I need to read a thesaurus more often. In the beginning, it's hinted at with few visual representations. It's a part of her, clearly, but it never defined her. At least up until the goddess deemed her the hero of women who had been assaulted. From there on out, nearly every other sentence of her internal monologue is about her assault. And not in that she's suffering, but in this passive, seemingly inappropriate tone. It's as if it's where her power came from, rather than her indomitable will. The idea of Red Sonya becoming a hero for a woman who had been assaulted isn't a bad idea in itself. It's a great idea, just not for a woman in a chainmail bikini who declares she'll only sleep with men who beat her in combat. I'll get to that, but her sexual assault, or to not be quiet about it, her brutal rape, is something that was at first implied and not stated because she's more than that. Red Sony is someone who overcomes. The problem is Omi's use of the goddess and having this deity declare Red Sony the protector of women. Immediately, this actually led to an interesting reason for Red Sony's outfit. Someone does ask her what her revealing outfit is meant for, since it offers so little protection, and Red Sony offers a believable reason, at least believable as something she'd say to explain it to another woman who is victimized like her. Not that it's entirely believable, but it's something that someone would make up on the spot. She wears it not to distract the enemy, but to invite predators to kill them. Because now she can't. Now she doesn't need to wear armor. Now no one can best her. Her chainmail bikini is a trap that will allow her to weed out and kill men like those who took her family away from her and hurt her. While I don't know if that makes sense in every outing, the way it's written in the moment itself as an explanation to another woman seems plausible and respectful, I guess? I don't necessarily believe if it's a reason an actual person would believe, but again, it sounds like a reason someone would make up to explain themselves. I truly can't say for sure though what is followed by my biggest problem with Redstone's origin as a whole. For some reason, Redstone will, and I quote, only lie with the man who can beat me in combat. This is completely counterintuitive to the supposed mission of her outfit. If they beat her and sleep with her, they're a monster who can overcome her skills. It's like she's saying that they can violate her if they're stronger than her. That's an absolutely terrible lesson to convey. That's not the intention. I can tell. But it's all so stupid that it's not going to work as a serious motivation. It taints everything around it. I really wish it hadn't ever been a part of the character. Something like that can be nothing better than a cruel joke. And here are her Red Sonya's backstory and believability. The fact that the goddess said this to her after she's been raped just doesn't sit right with me. I doubt this hurting teenager was thinking about consensual sex, and the idea that beating her in battle proves that a man is worthy is just a stupid relic of older times. It's just downright disrespectful. 
totally and completely. It made her and Sonya seem like a male fantasy at the worst moment. This was something the book did well to avoid for the most part, but failed at the most important moment. Then the goddess was seemingly made out to be the source of Red Sonya's skills? I don't like that idea of Sonya being skilled because of a goddess rather than her own merit. It turns her from this barbarian into this strange secret paladin in barbarian chains. I don't like it from a backstory sense. I don't dislike it because it's poorly written, which it isn't for the most part, but I dislike it because good writing doesn't change this ill thought out conceit. Her origin even goes so far to include her going on a quest to become pure again, which is just... Oh my god. This is a gross fixation on her assault without any emotionally real direction. It honestly kind of fetishized and is character defining. The longer it went on, the more tone deaf it got. So yeah, suffice to say, at first I loved this Red Sonia, but by the end I just wanted Omin to stop telling me what she was thinking. Her inner mala became nothing less than gross and insulting. And as for the final villain, well, back before I took a break from Choose Run. I called Cool and Goth a nothing villain, one I didn't even deem worthy to name, and this one he's built up throughout the whole omnibus. While he wasn't the most interesting thing ever, the way he's built up as a threat was an interesting detail of the book, I guess. The way it ends with him usurping the Russian doll like villains Red Sonya went through was pretty good. They have it finally end with the monster far above the rest, and it did make me interested to read more. His personality isn't all that deep yet, but the way he speaks both with pride and respect to people has me thinking and hoping he's more than just an overpowered evil wizard. So overall, this book started out strong, pretty strong in fact, but then it immediately fell flat on his face. Can't overstate how much this origin grossed me out. And it made me wish that Mike Carey somehow found the time to write Lucifer and Red Sonia, rather than let Michael Avon Oming do what he wanted with her origin. Then again, maybe Carrie's as much to blame and that would be incredibly disappointing as well. I get that to some people this may seem like a classic origin, but just because it's old doesn't make it a good idea. No matter how thought out the writing sounds, a bad and insulting idea is a bad and insulting idea. I'm willing to try another omnibus to work towards finishing the series, but I don't think I will. Between Dynamite being a rather unworthy company and the difficulty in finding used copies, this series doesn't seem worth the effort. I'm beginning to fear that I'll only like the Gail Simone's run. Outside of a few one-offs, Gail Simone's run seems like the only version of Red Sony that's entertaining without being offensive. And that's really sad. Okay, I just wanted to explain the new format that I was kind of experimenting with here. I've kind of struggled with trying to figure out what I can do with certain characters in certain videos because characters like Red Sonia, they don't have a lot of adaptations where I can place footage over me talking or anything. And I didn't want to just keep using the same footage over and over again. So I thought I'd try and spruce it up by recording me talking and then my facial reactions to certain things that weren't exactly all that great. And I think going forward when it comes to say lesser known characters or books like Red Sonia, where I'll struggle to find footage over top of it, or they're say not that modern, so they're they're not available digitally. Like with DC books, they're either available on DC Infinite or Marvel. They're available on Marvel Unlimited, where I can just put their modern uh, comics, digital comics, on my computer, take screenshots, and put them in the footage. But I can't really do that with certain other companies like Dynamite or Image or Boom. So if you don't mind it, if you like me seeing my face and seeing me talking and my reactions, uh, let me know. If you don't like them and you want me to kind of stick to putting up footage from like cartoons and movies and stuff, trying to put up comment panels as much as I can in preference to this format, then let me know too. I'll try to avoid books where I don't think I'll be able to put footage over top of me talking. But uh, yeah, if this is a good reaction, maybe I'll do more of them like this, maybe less, depends on what books I'm trying to review and go over and then how people react to it. Uh, Alright, thank you. Have a good day, good night, good morning, I don't know. Whatever's happening, wherever you are.